Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, uh, back with the Amiga. Uh, no surprise, it's uh, yeah, nothing but Amigas at the moment. Uh, so you can see we're using the 500 plus board here, this is the one I fixed in uh, part 2 and part 3, I think. Yeah, I'll cover this chip in the next video. Um, just to break things up, this is going to be a short video. Uh, I've got a drive here from Jamie Morgan. Uh, let me just read the letter that came with it. Uh, hello everybody, uh, yeah, that's how he always uh, starts his videos. Hello Mr Gadget UK, hope you're well, thanks for looking at my A1200 disk drive for me. I bought the A1200 last year, not used discs very much, but most of the time they played, then suddenly it stopped. I took it apart and cleaned as much as I could with the tools I had. Now it reads no DOS. Keep up the fantastic work with your channel, uh, it's amazing. By the way, I am a collector at one pound. Yeah, he made me laugh on uh, one of his recent videos, I'll post a link down below. He did a collection pickup of uh, R-Type, an R-Type 3 for the Super Nintendo. You can buy that, brand new. There's a brand new reproduction of R-Type and he got the collector's edition. And uh, he was so, so super excited to get it. He kept saying, uh, oh, I am a collector. And he must have said, I am a collector about a dozen times and I joked and said, if I had a pound for every time you said you were a collector, I'd be able to afford the, uh, this game myself. Yeah, so yeah, that's why he's put that. So here's the drive, uh, a little bit of corrosion. Now, one thought did cross my mind just opening this. We might find this works on here and it might be flawless. If it does, he's gonna have leaking caps in his 1200. That is not out of the realms of possibility. Um, so you can see this is a, a Chinon FZ354. I think I might have looked at this uh, model, not this drive, but this model previously on my channel. We'll connect this up to the 500 plus here. Obviously I'll power it off first. Um, I'll disconnect his uh, ribbon here. I can just use the one I've got and we'll give it a go. So yeah, the uh, motherboard is off the floor here. I don't have the case uh, that I was using previously because that 500 has been completely restored and sold. Um, let's just put that there. But I've got uh, I've got my two 500s to look at. There was going to be another board that you've not seen yet, and I got let down by the seller on eBay. I had for a month. I had literally hardly any communication and the seller eventually came back and said oh I'm really sorry I've been on holiday and the, the, the lads in the shop haven't sent your board out I'll correct that straight away another three weeks went by no board so yeah it's ended up with uh, negative feedback unfortunately uh, I suspect what it is the board that I won it was something like 26 quid and it was fully populated and I don't think the seller was happy with that so he decided to just string me along and hope that I wasn't bothered uh, with no receipt of a product, you know, he was probably just hoping that I would leave it and leave it and leave it until it was too late to raise a case and then he would get the money. Well, anyway, that's not how things transpired. So, that is good news. Error validating disk. Disk is unreadable. Uh, now, that could be a logic fault on the drive. Um, I've seen that error before. Do you remember in one of the previous parts here, we, in fact, it was this 500 plus motherboard we're looking at here actually. When I had the problem later in the video with the uh, floppy drive, you know, after I fixed all the, uh, you know, unreliable traces and then suddenly we came to test uh, and the floppy drive was failing with uh, some sort of non-DOS error, I think. You can get this error. There are numerous floppy read errors that you can get different types, you know. This one, this is one of them, error validating disk. And when, you, when I saw that down the motherboard, that was because the data signals coming from the heads were um, not getting to wherever they need to go, uh, polar, I think. And that's an important point to note, actually. There are a few things, you know, I, I, as I've mentioned a number of times, my videos are evolving all the time, my knowledge is expanding all the time, and I'm always changing things, not just my views and opinions on things, but also my understanding of things. So, like, when I was back in the trade, a number of engineers referred to Gary as the floppy disk controller chip and then that was it There was no reference to any of the chips and as we saw well as I talked about in the earlier videos the CIA one of the CIA's I think I mentioned uh, has got a relationship to the floppy drive well actually both of the CIA's have a relationship to a floppy drive I think one's used for input one's used for output of different signals and Paula actually is the thing that is responsible for reading the, the data from the drive and firing it via DMA to, I don't know, wherever, into memory. Um, so it's interesting, the floppy drive, you know, you, the, the floppy controller, Gary, yeah, not really. Gary is more of the original, you know, gate array 
hence the name Gary, um, with some floppy stuff. I think he controls like the motor on, motor off signals, and a few other things. But it's like the uh, you know again as I described in earlier videos, the fragment, the, the functionality is fragmented between Paula, two CIAs, and Gary. So let's get the pieces of uh, metalwork off here. Um, yeah, so I've got an elastic band around my hand there. I don't know why. <laughs> it's just so I don't lose the damn thing. Uh, I don't want the cats to get it. Yeah, if memory serves, I think this is like, is it hooked on one side? I can't remember. Yeah, it is. Look, it just slides up like that and then comes out. So that's that piece. Uh, and this is what you need to do with these. You've got to take off all these little bits. Don't be afraid of uh, going in there. You know, you can film it like this or take some photos of a part before you take it off so you know where it goes. Um, you could even, you know, stick a piece of sellotape over there so you know that that screw belongs in that bracket, you know. There's all sorts of ways of doing all this sort of stuff. Uh, it looks like Jamie has been in here, or someone has. Can you see these little bulge there? So someone's prized that apart previously. Uh, so let's just try and do that ourselves. We need to carefully lift up here like that. See that? There we go. Yeah, as I say, you can straighten these out with some pliers, you know, I'll show you. If it's uh, bent out a little bit, you know, you can just get some pliers on here and uh, and just bend it back the other way a little bit. But we'll do that afterwards, so let's check my disc out. Um, yeah, so Jamie did say uh, in that letter there that he's done the obvious things. Um, yeah, I can spot a problem with this already. I'm not sure if you can. But what's out of place? What's out of place there? Can you see anything suspicious? Anything suspicious and strange? Uh, yep, this piece of copper here. I think that is a shield that is normally maybe stuck on here. You can see there's a bit of green there. I'm guessing that that's a bit of glue. It's not corrosion, it actually looks like green plastic. Probably holds that on. And for one reason or another, it's come off and it's gone over here. And it's going to be affecting the mechanism, stopping the mechanism from moving here. I'm pretty sure that's what it that, that's what it's going to be. Super unusual. I'm glad Jamie sent me this because <laughs> I didn't think this was going to be so interesting, actually. Um, so the question now becomes: How on earth do you get that out of there? And I think actually the answer might be to remove that little screw there carefully. Uh, not these. Don't touch those. That's to do with the head alignment. And if you do that, you're in a whole world of hurts in trying to get the top head realigned with the bottom head. You need some special software and a scope, um, or at the very least a scope and some sort of test disc. You know, a disc that's been calibrated in order that you can work out uh, how to realign it. But if we just remove that little screw holding that uh, post, um, most of the times you'd never need to do this. This is the first time I've ever had to remove that little bracket, I think, actually. Um, but it'll just mean that once we, What's holding it there now? It's because it's through there, isn't it? There we go. Let's pull that off. Yeah, we can stick that back on in a minute. Just need to try and get it out without damaging it. That little bit there should come off as well. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Two bits. Those just hold. You know, they're the bit that mates here. Um, I'm just wondering what actually centres on the thing is it the plastic fitting I'm not sure anyway it just means that we've got a bit of free movement there you go you can just a bit of free movement there to get that out of the way so somehow we need to manipulate this bit of copper and it's, it's well and truly wedged in there look how on earth I'm gonna get that out remains to be seen I could try and force the head up there, but then it's trapped underneath. Look, and it's oh, there, it is. Ah, so there you go. I don't know if you saw that, I just knocked it down a little bit so it's flat. So if we now push the head up, we've now got visibility, I think, hopefully, to get this outlook. Uh, and I'm in two minds as to whether we attempt to stick that back down or whether we just do away with it. I'm gonna send it back to Jamie, but. Yeah, you can see that's that. So while we're here, we'll take advantage of uh, you know being able to clean that uh, up now. I think. 
So cotton board with IPA and we'll just remove all of this thick grease and hair, all those things. It's going to be cat hairs, cat hairs can get into these things super easily. So we've got all the grease off there now, that's pretty clean I think. Um, and we'll just get some fresh Mollicott on there. It's worth noticing the part number for that, Mollicott EM-30L, because there's loads of different types of Mollicott uh, that you can get for different things, and they're not all like a, you know, synthetic grease like this. Um, you can use this on plastic parts and metal parts, it's, uh, yeah, it's really good for things like this. Uh, yeah, I'll get all these little extra bits off, but yeah, that should be enough. I might just wipe some of that off, actually, it doesn't need quite so much there. Yeah, that'll do. So then we want to carefully move the head down to about that position, I think. Uh, I'll just wipe over this here. So this is the tricky bit, getting that back onto there. If we just carefully, yeah, there we go, push it. There we go, that's back in place. And then we need to do the same thing with this. Again, I'm just going to wipe off that bit of grease and I need to do the same thing, don't we, it went this way. This, this is the arm that goes over the track zero sensor over here. You know, as you can see on some drives it's over here, other drives it's here and it's done a different way. Uh, so the easy way to fit that is going to be to just move it up a little bit. Because if you go too low, you're going to have to somehow feed it through there. Um, in fact, we're going to have to do that to a degree anyway. Try and use the pliers here just to help me get this into position. Yeah, not easy at all. We're almost there. Look carefully, does it? There we go. So that's back on there, and then we need to get that super small screw back in, and hope it doesn't and hope it doesn't move around while I get the screw in. So, yeah, so I get the screw back in, whoa. That's it. You know when you've got it because it goes tight, the only way you can rot move that now is by rotating this bar here, like that. Anyway, we'll let the uh, drive do it itself uh, in a minute. Uh, I think, I think the other thing I will do now is I'll clean the heads up anyway. I think we'll test it. The reason being is because it'll just prove to Jamie whether that was the fault or not, or whether there was something else, but that won't have been helping, you know, because it was wedged at a diagonal angle, wouldn't it? So it's going to stop the head from moving. But we'll just give it a try. I'll, I will clean up the heads myself again in a minute, uh, and I'll put some contact clean into these switches here as well. But it'd be just nice to sh evidence, you know, show Jamie that if he'd noticed that, maybe... He could have done, done this himself, let's give it a try. So we switched on. You can see the head every now and again doing its little seek there. Let's get the disc in. Booting, I think. Yep, there you go, Jamie. So I want to just show you that. that uh, I mean, it's frustrating for you because you're thinking, oh, no, I should have seen that because I wouldn't have had to send it off. But that's what the issue was. Um, but I will clean it up for you anyway in a minute. We'll just, you know, we've got some mollicot on there already, but I'll clean those other things. And I'll just carefully reassemble it and it'll be uh, winging its way back to you. Sweet. So you've got to question A, where has that come from? Because it might not have come from the top there. And B, what is it doing? Um, the, the, you know, the thought that does cross my mind is it could be, it's more likely, thinking about this, it's more likely to be the piece of copper that goes on the underside of there, actually. Um, now, I don't want to go as far as stripping this right down to replace that because I don't think it's going to solve, you know, it's not, I don't think it's going to be required. I think that's going to make very little difference to anything. 
but uh, in terms of the original design here to do with uh, you know EMF you know noise and stuff it perhaps was fairly important back then I mean you could argue it's more important now because the amount of stuff that we've got going through the airways but uh, you know you saw it work there it worked first time super reliable super quick um, I've tested it a few times off camera no issues at all uh, so I will do more extensive testing but my guess is that can just literally go in the bin I'll send it back to Jamie um, if he's got the inclination, what he could do is strip it right down, take the head assembly off the rail here, right out of the drive, uh, because that's the thing, you know, you'd have to strip this down an awful lot, uh, I mean a real lot, <laughs> crazy amount really, to get to the underside of that, and then what, what you're going to stick it back down with, a bit of epoxy, what happens when it breaks off again, it's just going to fall underneath the drive and eventually get squished up here again, I think like it was. Um, but I suspect that that is off the underside one, not the top one, because that has already got one. It'd be crazy to have two on it. So we'll clean up with a cotton bud. Uh, it looks like Jamie's already cleaned this, but um, it's not going to do uh, any harm just to go over this uh, again. There's a bit of corrosion there. I'll get that off with a fiberglass pen and a bit there. Look, yeah, we'll just clean in there as well. But again, I think Jamie's probably already been in here. He might not have done that. I think he's just focused on the heads. But you've got to do this, because if you don't get rid of the dust out of here, this is just going to work its way into the head mechanism at some point. You know, it's going to end up on one of the heads there. We'll just give under there a go, but I can tell Jamie's uh, had a go at that previously. It's pretty clean. We'll just get the excess mollycott off there. Now it's moved up and down once or twice. It doesn't need all that on it. So, despite the fact it's working, we will just carefully uh, lift the head there. I've got a bit of plastex. You can see that on the end of the cotton bud there, a little bit of plastex. And uh, we're going to give the uh, head a clean with a bit of plastic, so then I'll clean it with IPA as well. You know, you could argue that it doesn't need this because it's working, but there could be still a little bit of dirt on there that you know could help collect more dirt over time. Yeah, this top head is always difficult to do with the plastics. I'm deliberately trying to not put much pressure. On there at all you know if you over if you stress this here this is where from time to time as I showed a previous video you might need to move this spring here up to the next step to give this spring here slightly more tension uh, but it's quite rare more often than not you'll find that when you need to do that sort of thing it might be because the little sleds worn here the plastic pieces that slide up and down here as well um, yeah it's very rare to have to do that I think I had to do that once or twice back in the day um, but that was 30 odd years ago it is very rare to need to adjust that spring. So yeah, IPA now. And the same on the top head. Carefully, carefully. With IPA. The other thing I'm going to do is just use the IPA now just to go around the bomb, outside of the uh, bomb. And uh, whilst we're here, although again, Jamie's done that. And we'll go right inside there as well yeah that's okay hardly anything came out of there so I think we'll uh, just reassemble that and uh, test it there's a bit of fluff there look yeah it's not going to do any harm just to gently clean some of these are the bits here as well so I'll just show you any of these bits of metal here you can just gently bend them with the pliers you know I've bent these ones back in so that the profile is perfectly straight uh, and you can see the similar thing here, just start to do this, these are, are bent as well because obviously there's been some force, you can see that, some force used there, um, and it's a similar thing, you can just squash downwards, and squash, grip, grip, you know, just grip with pressure, you can see that's pretty straight now, this one here, look, it's just stuck out a little bit, uh, and they might need to be stuck out just a tiny bit, I'm not sure, but yeah, it doesn't look right to me. So I got all this rust off with some uh, with a wire brush and the uh, fiberglass pen. It'll look a bit ready still, but I've uh, wiped over that with the WD-40 as well. And we're just going to do the same with the bits. You can see there's just a couple of little bits here. You know they're super smooth now. They're not. There's no resistance from the cotton bud there, so the, the rusty surface has actually gone. Uh, we'll just wipe over those. So again, you've seen it all before. It's uh, what I'm trying to do here is just get. A load of this here like that this is so that when I spray it with something without a, a nozzle here I'm not going to get it absolutely everywhere I'm we'll just give it a quick spray like that that'll do 
yeah so most of it has been contained there but we got a little bit of that contact cleaner there just onto the tops of these and that's what I was aiming for you get it onto the tops and push them in and out like that it'll leak inside the switch so I'll just clean up the button we'll give it a test Yeah, and around there as well, look, there's something blue stuck on there, not sure what that is. I was going to say cat hair until I realised it was blue. Unless Jamie's got blue cats, he's not been dying them, has he? He uh, creates uh, some wonderful things out of hammer beads. It's worth checking his channel out for that. Uh, you know, nice pieces of artwork there. He takes, like, sprite work and artwork from games and things and creates, uh, creates them using hammer beads, you know, so... You could even maybe commission Jamie to build you one of those if you wanted. You know, make one. You could stick on the wall somewhere, frame it. So, booting again. And first time. No worries at all. That's always what I like to see. If you've got a problem that it doesn't work the first time and then you reseat the disc and put it back in, you know, you do need to check things again. Because it should work 100% reliably right from the, the start. You know, every single time you change the disc, it should work. If it doesn't, you need to uh, do all the things uh, we've looked at in this video here. Uh, I'm sorry we've been covering old ground again. One of the things I would say with the Amiga 500, there are not a massive amount of things to show you because everything's socketed, and this is one of the reasons why there's not a, perhaps a huge amount of 500 repair videos on YouTube. It really is, in most instances, just a case of swapping out chips between boards, and you can very easily, with little experience, just work out where the fault is, just based on chip swapping. It's one of the nice things with the 500, really, that uh, everything is socketed, with the exception of the data path and RAM. So just to extend this video out, I thought we'd do uh, another drive here. This one's from uh, a 1200 as well, I think. I uh, can't see the model number, it's a TIAC. Uh, yeah, this is one I've not looked at before, I don't think, an FD235F. So this one doesn't work either. We might not be able to repair this one, I don't know, um, because the thing is, there's lots of drives out there, and people say, you know, oh, I tried everything and it just couldn't be uh, fixed, you know. Some people have said that the heads have failed, etc. I don't know whether they, they actually know that, whether they've actually checked it in, in a way to determine that the heads are the actual cause, whether they just guess it. Uh, it's hard to, uh, you know, know. Um, there obviously are instances out there where the heads do fail. But nevertheless, I thought we'd give this a try on another drive. You know, we'll try. We'll have a look at this. It's a different drive. Uh, some stuff's arrived. Uh, the drive, as I mentioned, was Jamie Morgan's, the previous one. It's already gone back to him. But I've ordered him a copy of this. It was It's cheap. It's not a lot of money. Um, Gunby. Um, it's on CD. It looks like the company that sells these is, you know, just burning it, basically. That's what it looks like. So I'll test these out before I send a, a copy over to Jamie but the discs look okay uh, the artwork's quite nice there the company I ordered that from actually sent me this uh, magazine as you can see Amiga Future here which is quite cool so uh, yeah I'll have a read through this later so if you listen you can hit click in let's just put a uh, bubble bubble in and let's just see what happens Yeah, it just went dit, 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 and that's it. Let's take the disc out, put it back in again. Yeah, same thing. Not detecting the disc. But, you know, I reckon someone's not even been in this. I can tell, you know, the metal there has not even been interfered with. So somebody's not even attempted to clean it. I don't get it. I don't get why there are loads of these drives. There's like four or five on eBay at the moment. One seller is trying to sell four or five of these for £15 each as faulty. I mean, maybe you could argue if you're running a business, the amount of time you need to invest, you know, it could be take you 15, 20 minutes to clean one of these up. It's not worth it. You better off just selling it as faulty. Maybe that's the reasoning behind it. But it just seems to me, uh, from my experience, any faulty Amiga drive you see on eBay, you can buy it and they can all be fixed. I haven't seen one yet. I keep buying these like this and I can't find one that doesn't work after it's been serviced. So we'll just try and get in there. Um, there was a screw there, so maybe someone has been inside it. Yeah, I can't be 100% sure, but it looks like there might be a bit of dirt on the right. I'll just inspect that with a magnifier, and if there is, I'll show you on a macro. 
So I've got a tiny bit of uh, Meguiar's Plast RX, uh, it's this stuff. Um, yeah, you can't see it for the label there, but it says Plast RX, Plast Dash RX from Meguiar's. Um, I'm going to use this straight away right at the start here, just to sh because I'm going to assume that somebody has been inside this previously and IPA on its own has not done the job, I think. So we'll just go, just go lightly around on the surface there. Clean up with some IPA in a minute. Yeah, so same thing on the top head. Sorry, you can't see that very well. So now with some IPA, I will clean around the heads in a minute as well. Yeah, I'll go around the uh, general area there. Sorry if it's blurring a little bit of that. And the interesting thing on this is, is the assembly stop is all around. The little uh, motor here with the bar, the, the worm bar, or whatever you call it there, is on this side. Um, I'm going to get some molly cotton here right at the start, I think, actually. Um, where's the track zero sensor? Is it this here? I don't know. What on earth's that? Yeah, I think that's got to be something to do with it. Uh, anyway, we'll just uh, try and get the grease off here. Oh no, the track zero sensor's down there. That's the track zero sensor. So if you get a bit of fluff in there, it will think it's at track zero when it isn't. So yeah, I'll try and uh, just blow a bit of air. If you've not got compressed air, a blow like that will do the same thing. Now you've got a bar down there, so sometimes it's something I forget to mention, you know. You have something on this side, but something on the other side, and normally, as I say, this is on that side there, and there'll be a bar on this side. You want to get grease on both of those, really. So as I say, we'll get a little bit onto there. We don't really need masses. It'll get distributed as the uh, carriage moves around. Just get the excess off the metal parts there and off the edges. That will do, I think. I'm going to go test it. So an important thing to note here is you always need to make sure you get pin one the right way. You know, you see the red stripe here. Um, and if you look, just can you see down there? On the, I don't know, you can see on the silk screen, there's a little white one and a two. Yeah, it's super hard to see because it's kind of like under the ribbon. You can see the one there, just on the very corner of the connector and the two. Uh, so always make sure you get your pin one and two around the right way. You can tell someone's pulled this off at a funny angle previously because the uh, connections are bent there a little bit. But yeah, try and push it straight on. Uh, always make sure you get your power connected up as well. So let's switch the Amiga on. So you can see it seek straight back there. That's a good sign. If you didn't see back there, I would be thinking the track zero sensor is the issue there. But the fact it did seek back shows that that track zero sensor is okay. You know, there's no fluff or anything in there. So still not working, so it might be caps, I think. Very interesting. Maybe we do have faulty heads on this one. The other thing I'm thinking is because this I don't like this spring mechanism here, it could well be that there is not enough tension on that top head. Okay, switch it off. Something I'm just going to try as well is, see the little ribbons here? Is just pull it out and push it back in and do the same with that one. Pull it out carefully. You've got to be careful because you don't want to break them. Push it back in. Just see if that makes any difference. I don't think it will, but... No, very interesting. So, let's uh, have a, another look at the drive. So we'll take this piece of metal off the bottom here and let's just see what's on the underside here. Well, someone's bodged a capacitor on there, can you see that? So someone has had a go at fixing this. Uh, yeah, I'm always a bit disturbed when I see that actually. So this is the first time I'll have seen one of these where somebody has tried to fix it and uh, it's not working. Hmm. 
The first thought is I wonder if they've got the right size capacitor here. Is it even soldered on properly? I don't know. Um, but I would also guess there's going to be additional capacitors on this PCB here. So I'll go and strip this down a little bit further I think and we'll just have a look. So I should be using the ESD mat for this but my uh, Amiga two, one of my Amiga 2000 boards is on the uh, ESD mat just now. So let's remove those screws there. Let's just see if we can carefully just work out how to unclip this here. Yeah, it goes like that, doesn't it? That's it. Um, and then I'm guessing, yeah, that should come out of there. But then we'll need to disconnect these again. Just pull them out. Can't get them around the wrong way because of the nature of the way they're uh, set up there. There's going to be a flex ribbon here. Can you see that? So we'll just carefully use these and just carefully pull that out. Well, hopefully that might be it. Yeah, there we go. So the board is out. So yeah, that capacitor there is my first thought. But uh, yeah, I'll inspect this super close and uh, report back if I find anything. So I've removed that cap. Um, I'm just going to go and uh, research one of my previous repairs, actually. The cap that was on here is 4.7 microfarads. And that just seems quite a large capacitor, actually, because this is used for timing here. And I've just got recollections that it should be something like 0.47 microfarads. Although I've not looked at this particular drive, I've seen one that's almost identical in terms of the layout here. It's got the same uh, crystal uh, resonator package here, you know, this little blue thing. Um, and let's say, I just can't for the life remember the exact cap size, but the other thing is we don't know where this came from. Did it come from an old board or something? It can't, the pins look a little bit corroded underneath it actually, so I don't know. Maybe the cap is not good. Um, anyway, I'll report back in a minute. Well, this is really interesting. This might be the first one that defeats me. Um, one thing I just noticed, I moved the carriage up here, you know, by rotating the worm bar there. I put it back on and the motor's going and it wasn't moving so you know I moved it back round again it started to rotate and then I you know powered it back up and the head moved back again and I repeated that whole thing a few times it didn't jam up again but um, yeah we might need to get some contact cleaner into that the stepper motor could be the issue on this because I've never had one of those jam before like that there was no, no reason for it there was no explanation of why it would get uh, jammed there but I'm going to give the heads a clean again. I might even get the demagnetizer onto this in a minute because I seem to be getting nowhere with it. I've still got the one cap to swap out on the underside of that board, but. If I measure the resistance of this pot here, I think someone's been tinkering. Um, 32K, I think it's a 33K uh, pot actually, because between the other pin there, look at that. Well, I swapped that cap and uh, yeah, it didn't make a difference. But I think I've worked out what's wrong with this, and this is why, given, not give, you know, don't give up. What I'm trying to show you is don't give up. Experimentation can sometimes lead to the uh, cause, you know, or an explanation of what the issue is. Um, I just found that just by lifting the head slightly here, it booted actually. This is, I'll show you. If I switch it off and on now, it's just going to go, did it, did it, did it. Um, Nothing, yeah. Now what I'm going to do here is just as it starts to boot, lift it, and just look at the screen. Working. So what we have here is a mechanical issue. Now this might not be solvable, but so if I just power this off, let me just show you something about this particular mechanism. This is this is my least favourite Amiga drive. I don't like this drive. I suspect that's what's happening. I suspect the head is sagging on one side just a little bit, which means you get in uh, an uneven read. Yeah, that's just the same. Let me just repeat the thing just to see if I can show you what I mean. If I just hold the, if I lift the head up, point at the screen, I'll lift the head up, I'll tell you when I'm doing it, hang on. And wait for it to move first. Right, I'm lifting it now. See that? 
there you go. Just with a little touch instantly reads, and it literally is just as you touch it, bang, it reads. So there is a bad connection there. So a correction, it's not head related, it's the stepper. It is to do with it jamming. See that? Yeah, I'm convinced that's what it is. I don't think there's anything I'm going to be able to do about that. Any resistance at all and it jams up. Yeah, I think it needs a new stepper. Well, this one is being a pain in the you-know-what. Let me just show you what I know about this now. Just watch. Watch the first time. So you hear it, duh, 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 right? But the head does not move. Just watch what happens when I push it. Now, it, it's white screening, you know, coming up with a kickstart uh, icon there. Just watch, hang on. I put a bit of pressure there. Let me try that again. If I put a bit of pressure on it, upwards. Um, moved it too far there. Somewhere around here. With a little bit of pressure, it actually finds track zero. Let me try that again. So I'm not sure if it's a mechanical thing here with the actuator arm. The stepper. Or the track zero sensor. One thing of note, when you move this board, when you remove this, see these the copper pads here? The board can move like that, and the track zero sensor is on this board. So if you unscrew this board, I would be tempted to draw little marks paint you know paint it around the screw before you remove the screws because otherwise you won't get it back in the right position in regards to track zero so there are two issues going on here track zero is not aligned correctly and you've got to get that absolutely spot on like probably within I don't know a tenth of a millimeter in terms of accuracy maybe even more accurate um, but there is some sort of issue with the the thing not stepping when it goes do dirt that something should be moving and it isn't there's no movement when you hear those three pwm noises there so hmm. so as you can see i've taken the top head off and there's a good reason for this there is a problem with the head just watch this piece of metal here sorry yeah i'm a bit close there this piece of metal the head was would slide you can see that it slides in now the head was moving around so it wasn't secured to this piece of metal so you had an alignment problem with the head this comes right off and in fact that's what happened I was messing experimenting pulling it forward a bit pushing it back a bit and then it started booting games were actually working perfectly well some games were I tried Vroom and that was three quarters of the disc was reading as soon as it got further up it was struggling but Bubble Bobble was working and uh, the Ocean Sucker uh, just a test disc I've got that was working so I was trying to dial it in perfectly and then I was just getting nowhere. Every time you moved it a little bit, it slipped back again. Every time you changed the disc, because this piece of metal is loose, the head would move just as a result of changing the disc, despite the screws being super tight at the back. So I don't know whether someone's tried to adjust the head previously. Um, I suspect what's going on here, there's supposed to be something inside a piece of plastic or something to hold that metal to stop it from moving, but it pulls right out. I've just slid it back in, it does pull right out. So you can see I've pushed it back in and aligned it with the hole there. You can see the little silver hole, you can see the ribbon underneath it. So I'm going to stick a little bit of, uh, what's it called, lock nut stuff. It's like your stuff you stick on uh, screw heads and things to keep them from moving. I'm going to just dribble a bit into that little hole there. Just make sure it's as far in as it possibly can be. Uh, I can clean the head up super easily now, as you can see, because we've got the underside of the head here. So I'm going to give that a go with some more plastics and IPA. But I know the head is not the issue. It's the, it's the assembly and it's the fact that the alignment is off. So whether it's been adjusted in the past and that's the problem, I don't know. 
Um, but something should be holding the metal to the plastic part here and that is not happening. You know, the head was just moving around. Um, so yeah, that is without a doubt the issue with this drive. So even if I can't get it working, at least I know what the issue was. Um, but it would be nice to maybe try and repair it. So yeah, I'll deal with that and I'll stick it back on. I couldn't find any of the uh, stuff I was going to use, so I used uh, hot glue actually and just melted it through the hole, so you can't see that very well, through the hole and through to the other side. I just lifted the ribbon carefully, but yeah, there's a big lump of glue on each side of the metal, you know, securing it into the plastic part. So provided I got that nice and straight, which I think I have, that should be okay. Yeah, we've got a bit of a blob there, but who cares? If that holds it together and it works, that's all we're interested in. So I'll clean this head up now and we'll refit it. Yeah, so you wouldn't want to deliberately remove this in order to clean a head up. Well, unless the drive is completely non-functional and no matter what you do to it, it's not recovering. Um, because, yeah, under normal circumstances you would never need to alter the head alignment here, but I've got no choice in this case. So we'll clean the bottom head up as well, may as well, because it's easily exposed. So in order to get this back on, we just need to carefully try and fold the ribbon down the little guide there, I think. Yeah, easier said than done. Come on, go in, that's it. And then put it over there like that, and then just put the screws back in place. So after shoving it on there, uh, you'll see straight away that we've got some good signs of life. Just watch. Boot sector picked up, and then we got some problems. That was a reseek. That was all right. That's a reseek. Reseek. Yeah, and then we got an error. But bear in mind, we had nothing before. It wasn't doing anything. But the track zero sensor is a factor as well. It was only the point where I adjusted the track zero, you know, the position of the PCB underneath to move the sensor there. I eventually got some signs of life similar to this, where it was just about seeing the boot sector. And then I found if you just like touched or lift the, lifted the head on this side here, it would detect the boot sector. What I didn't realize is it was because this whole head was loose, the top head was floating. So what I need to do now is I'm just going by eye. If you look at that, can you see? It looks kind of tilted this way. Yeah, if you look at the head there, can you see it's tilted to the right a little bit? So I'm just going to, by eye, tilt it a little bit to the left, ever so fractionally. But this will be trial and error now because I don't have the right knowledge, tools and skills and things to do a proper adjustment of this. You'd need a calibrated test disc, a scope, and you need to know exactly what you're scoping on the head. Presumably the actual head itself. Uh, and then you need to adjust correctly. Let's just uh, do a few adjustments like that and just give it a few tries and see what difference that makes. Still getting a reseek there. But you see the track zero adjustment might be something that needs adjusting as well here. One thing I have found is when you're messing with the track zero adjustment, always move the head away from the sensor before you retry it, even if the power is still on. Because Unless it reseeks back there, you try and adjust it while it's, I don't know, while it's on, for example. It's the same with the heads. So here's the final part of this that's uh, sealed the faders drive, just watch. It's not gripping the head. So we've got a problem with that as well. Yeah, I don't know what has been done to this drive before I got it, but it looks like the board had been unscrewed, which means the track zero sensors misaligned, the motor was jamming up, the motor jamming up could be something to do with what's occurred to the damage on the carriage here, I mean you shouldn't be able to just freely push it like that, it would take a fair bit of resistance which is why you've got to rotate this to get it to go around but it's not even moving now so I think the little catch on the underside of that has worn off so I'll strip it right down just to show you but yeah I'm going to give up on this, this is beyond So I undid the two screws on the back of the motor here to get the motor out. Remove this screw here which frees up the rail on that side there. Obviously disconnected the head uh, there but you can see we've got that out solely. So the problem with this now, can you see this little back black piece of plastic on the bottom? You can just about see the remainder of a little notch on it but 
hardly anything at all and this metal spring now what I might be able to do is bend this metal spring like that so that it holds the bar more firmly against that I'm going to try that now and we'll get a load of grease in there just to make sure this is really well greased and I'll give it one final try well you are not going to Adam and believe this uh, where's that quote from? Uh, answers down below it's working um, not only is it working I managed to get the head alignment perfect all I did, took the disc out, forced the mechanism shut, I'll show you how to do that in a minute, and then looked down into the drive there, and got the heads perfectly lined up on top of each of the square, tightened up the two screws here, bear in mind we glued the little thing down there, you saw that the spindle wasn't going up and down, I took all that apart, I don't know whether I filmed any of that actually, I just got that frustrated with the blooming thing. What I ended up doing is the piece of black plastic here, there's a little channel, I think I might have shown that bit, and there's like a, a there was a notch well, you know, um, worn out of it. So I melted the very edge with the soldering iron on both sides, and you can see, you know, it's moving up and down the, the shaft there, no problems at all. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I honestly can't believe it. Let's try some different discs. So, what is strange about this is it boots bubble bobble and bubble me well nothing else. And there's no reseeks or anything. I'm thinking that track zero alignment might be the main issue that's now outstanding but a little knock to this head and it's misaligned I did that a minute ago actually just trying to load a few different discs and suddenly it wouldn't load bubble bubble again I had to take the disc out realign the heads bubble bubble bubble, bubble back in and then it's working again that's the third time now after ejecting it and moving it and testing it it's working so I need to secure that little metal thing, I'm gonna to have to get a bit of super glue, so I'm gonna use a bit of super glue on the top of the plastic where it joins the metal on the underside. Carefully just remove this now. I've just realized that board's loose, that might be a part of the problem as well here. Let's just just retest that again now because that's gonna affect the track zero alignment actually. Yeah, it's booting still. So, like, loose still setting. I'm just using workbench here, you'll see. Hang on. Boot sector. No worries. Reads a few tracks, and then we get a reseek. Hang on. Yeah, reseek. Reseek. And we've got that. But I'll just show you. If I take that disc out, switch it off carefully. Hopefully I've not messed the alignment up just by moving it like this. Switch it off. Leave it for a few seconds. Boot sector, no problem. And it's loaded. No reseeks so far. Yeah, so not one single reseek. It's loading super quick. It's nearly loaded, I think. Um, so I'm thinking, the final thing, the reason workbench doesn't work and fewer discs I think it's the track zero I think I just need to just uh, just tweak the track zero alignment just a little bit and then maybe other discs will work I don't know well I have to confess this drive is doing my blooming head in it won't read anything but the bubble bobble disc it's crazy it's a bubble bobble drive but there's no reseeks and it loads super quick like less than 30 seconds um, I've tried adjusting the track zero alignment underneath and you know, you just just makes no difference. Makes no difference at all. All I can assume is the alignment is still not quite right. I might need to move the top head slightly to one side of here. I mean, even though I've put that super glue there, I can do that with these screws here. But I'm kind of reluctant to do that. It took me this long to get this, you know, to this point. Um, I guess it's a learning exercise. I might just continue to tinker. So I'm going to give the tape head a demagnetizer go here actually because Bubble Bubble works perfectly. I mean perfectly, not even a reseek. And other games don't even boot. It's crazy. I've tried adjusting the uh, Track Zero sensor. It makes no difference. So this is on now. And as I move it near I can feel it vibrating. And you want to go around in circles. Hang on. Touch the head there. And then just move away from it. You can just go over the top of the area there as well just in case something on the surface has become magnetized but anyway let's give that a try see if that makes any difference i don't expect it will 
<laughs> you know, yeah, this is just crazy, absolutely crazy. The number of issues I've had with this drive, this has been demonic. This has been a drive from hell, this drive. I'm sort of kidding here, but we had a problem with the, the flux, you know, it wasn't reading the magnetic uh, flux there from the uh, disc. Uh, I've added a capacitor, there you go, I've just invented the flux capacitor. <laughs> and as you'll see, this disc did not boot previously, and none of the, half the other discs didn't. Bubble Bobble was fine. And this is the thing, I'll show you, watch, boot sector, bang, first time I've ever seen the boot sector on this disc, and let me just point you back a wall hip fire, and I'll show you, we'll get the uh, next part pretty much instantly, there we go, never seen that before on this disc. So, a flux capacitor is not required, can you see the issue? Look at this side here. This side here is lifting the head up on one side. The number of issues with this drive, it, it staggers, it really is just beyond belief, it really is. So I need to bend that sort of in this position here. Yeah, that's a little bit warped now, uh, hang on. The main thing is trying to get it to sit lower on that side. Yeah, I might just give that a go, I think. So now I have to mess with the alignment again because I've been uh, messing with it to try and get some discs working. So the way to do this, so the way to do this, and I appreciate you can't really see anything here. Um, I don't think you can. The idea is try and get un undo the screws, um, and then yeah, again, you're not going to be able to see what I'm doing here. Just try and align the heads perfectly. The only way you can do it is to look down the little slot there. Um, and it's hard to judge whether it's far forward or too far back, but you, yeah, a little bit of experimentation, you get it in just the right spot, tighten up the one screw and retest it. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think this drive is a giver upper. This is the first drive that, it's not really defeated me because I know exactly what's wrong with it. There's a lot of wear, you know, we had wear on the plastic part that goes up and down the worm uh, thing there. The spring has lost its tension. The piece of metal was, uh, that holds the head is sl was sliding around in there, free form. You know, I had to put that blob of glue to secure that. And then because there's not enough tension, I'm having to weight the uh, thing down here. And we saw the metal was bent as well. So yeah, it's been mangled by a previous owner at some point this, but nevertheless, this is the only time, I'll show you, this is the only time workbench is loaded after sticking that pound coin on the head. Let me show you. This is a similar thing Jan Beater did on a 1541 drive, I think. Uh, yeah, and it's showing the correct amount of bytes free. Well, you're not going to believe this, but I have fixed this. I have, and I'm, I'm not being big headed here, I've spent a lot of hours on this, maybe seven or eight hours. You, you wouldn't believe it, but I am an expert <laughs> at manually adjusting one of these without a scope, adjusting the heads and getting it absolutely perfect. There are a number of things you've got to take into account if I just switch this off. The first thing is on this revision here, as I say, these screws are critical. The first thing I would do is if someone's tinkered with this and it's not reading the discs is undo that screw, undo this screw, just use this one, you know, start right on one side, tighten it up, test it, if it see what it's like. You know, you can hear that it's going did it. Did it, did it, or that it's booting normally when you get rereads. What I mean by a reread, it'll be going, dit, 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 and then it'll go, did it, did it, did it. That's a reread. You hear, you'll hear a, a pattern there as it's going over the same bit. If you're getting that, just adjust it until you're not getting that. Now, if you've got a problem where, like I have, where someone has adjusted the, uh, well, it'd come loose, hadn't it? The metal part had come loose from the plastic piece of the heads there. So I had no choice but to take this off to fix it. And it, you know, the head had been sliding around. That is ultimately what was wrong with this. This head had become loose. That's why somebody else couldn't fix it. They then swapped out that cap. They had already swapped out that cap, looking at the eBay advert. I didn't need to swap that one or that one. Um, the problem was they'd had this board off, but this head was the issue, it was loose. So you've got to make sure it's secure to the metal piece below it, so that the, you know the heads can't just float around. If you've got that problem, if you've got that problem, which I suspect you might get on this revision, not the other drives, I've never seen that before, but on this revision that might happen. You might have to do what I did and take it off. So then becomes the issue when you put it back together because you've got to get this right here. That affects your track zero position. Now there's a caveat. Let me just take the drive out. And this is the thing. I only spotted this yesterday, and I'll tell you how I work this out. Because this notch here, 
This is like a, a fine adjust for track zero. You can unscrew these two screws here, and currently that one is not tightened up. I'm just going to tighten that one up actually now before I get the right screwdriver before I lose the alignment. Um, now you remember bubble bobble, bobble, bubble bobble, can't talk right. Bubble bobble was working, and other games weren't. So I had this room disc in here yesterday. I re read the boot sector, it always did, and the screen would just go black, and the head would just go doo -doo, and it would stop, and then it just go do it. And what I did is I just pressed here slightly, and as soon as I did that, when it went do do. The a, a slight pressure here meant that it actually read the track. I was putting some pressure, some upward fall forward pressure on the head here, and then it read the next track. And I pressed it again, and it read the next track. And I thought, this has got to be something to do with the track alignment. So even though I've got the heads aligned perfectly for bubble bobble, this disc its tracks ever so slightly differently aligned. I might do some diagrams to show you what I mean towards the end of this video. And I thought that how how can you find adjust it without adjusting the heads? And that wasn't, you know, if you adjust these, if one disc is working perfectly and you need to adjust these, that's not right. You're moving the alignment out. So as soon as you get one disc working 100% with no rereads, these do not need adjustment. You might need to adjust this if this is set crazy. I mean, you can see where that is now for reference, and that looks like the one of my previous. I've covered this drive previously, and that looks like it's in the same position as it was previously. But the final thing, and that room, you know, me putting a bit of pressure there, I saw this here previously and thought, I wonder if this here, if you, because if you think about it, if you, this is a stepper, so this bar here it doesn't just uh, you know it's not like the uh, mcu whatever on here has got control of that bar to the point uh, point where it can uh, rotate it maybe i don't know a thousandth of a millimeter or a thousand thousandth of an inch can say it it doesn't do that it steps there'll be a predefined amount that it steps you know notch 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 maybe a half notch yeah so the it stands to reason if you adjust this one way or the other ever so slightly uh, and I'm talking like you know a quarter of a millimeter and then tighten it it will work and that's exactly what has happened the minute I did that after coming up with that theory last night I thought well, let's get room back in I was trying it it wouldn't work I thought let's just do that and I adjusted it moved it a tiny 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 like a a gnat's wing uh, width you know to the right hand side uh, and if I power that back on you will see it boots perfectly. So I'll tell you when they get the black screen. So I had to cut there because I nearly lost it again. Is it loading? Yeah, what happened there is I messed up the track zero alignment from the underneath of the drive. And in fact, I can tell that because I've just had to adjust that, this needs adjusting again. Let's just switch it off. This is the problem. You need to make sure your screws are all tightened up um, before you start moving the drive after you've got it calibrated properly. So I've knocked it out already. So let's just move this tiny back to the right there. Screw it back tight. Try that again. Yeah, it's working now. That's it. That's what it needed. And that's because, like I say, I just had to readjust the track zero sensor. But trust me, that is working. I can see it moving a little bit. Yep. That's normal. Let me point you to the screen. There you go. So until I did that, uh, that little adjustment with the motor, like I said, this game and many others were not working. Only Bubble Bobble would work. Um, so that is how you adjust the uh, alignment on these and you can do it by eye and ear Yeah, there we go Sweet So I will test a load more discs on that now. I need to think of something to do with that spring um, It might not need the capacitor because that head has had so much manipulation now to try and get it to Straighten out and we straightened out the metal bit. Maybe that cap on the spring is not required Yep, yeah, another disc that would not read at all on this uh, machine. Fantastic. So testing uh, June here, and that's loading as well. No rereads. Fantastic. 
this is just amazing i would have never guessed that i could myself just from a bit of trial and error learning here realign the heads correctly top head to the bottom head fix the little plastic piece that slides on the worm bar there by melting it because you know i don't know that i showed you it was just free wheeling the bar was rotating the head wasn't moving so i fixed that you know got the alignment of track zero correct and tweaked the track alignment using the motor it's incredible i'm absolutely amazed i'm so pleased i spent the crazy number of hours on this drive because if i had another drive like this now with similar faults i could resolve it pretty quickly actually i'm talking like in the region of about 20 minutes Yeah, it goes that way. Um, I'm going to test this on all of my remaining uh, discs I've got here. I mean, I've got tons more in the loft, but I've not got that many here. I've not got very many originals out. I've probably got about 70 or 80 original games in the loft, but including Turrican and stuff. But anyway, we'll just give this a test with some of my other uh, games. I might even try it without that cap now, because, um, in fact, let's try that. It might not be needed. Um, because remember, this was bent up at one point. In fact, let's just try June again. It may just well be that because it's been used and it's had weight on it for a period of time that it's straightened out. Because the little metal uh, piece, you know, the piece that joins the screw things here to the head, it's really thin stuff actually. So, yeah, I mean, that's booted. No problem. So it didn't seem to need that in this case. Let's try some of the games on it. Let's try Vroom again. The thing with Vroom is you get, uh, it, it detects the boot sector super quick with room, it goes black screen instantly, and then it moves a couple of tracks, and then it hangs there for a second or two, it makes you think it's not working. But then, as you saw, duh, duh, it stops again. Yeah, so you can think it's not working, it's just taking a while to load in. But that's working as well, so, yeah, looks like I don't need my flux capacitor neither. Just working my way through testing all of my uh, Mega discs here. I mean, there's only about 30 or so, the ones that I've got out. Sweet. Even my copy of uh, Indiana Jones is working as well. That wasn't working previously. So I'm getting to the end of my discs here. I've gone through oh, about 30 or 40 discs here. Uh, I've just got, uh, what's it called, another world to test. That's the last set of discs here, if that works, you always get a pause though, it's because it's loaded, um, if that works then that's it, it's a success, complete success, but it's good to test on a variety of, uh, you know, but, you know, record, you know, copied discs and um, originals, uh, as many originals and copied discs as you can, preferably copy discs that come from different uh, drives and things in the past, these have, a lot of these have been uh, written on different drives. What I'm going to do is my Lotus 3, uh, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, it's got a corruption on the second disc. So I'm going to rewrite that on my A1200. I'll find a copy of it, ADFs and I've got a, a utility on the 1200 there to read an ADF file and write it to a disc. Uh, and I'll test that on here as well after I've done that to make sure it's got good alignment with the 1200. Yep, and that worked as well. So that's it, every single Amiga disc I currently have uh, available to me here to test works perfectly. So there we go, all back together. Uh, I'm not convinced that's clipped on there properly actually. Does it go under the bottom piece maybe? Yeah, it does. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, so all back together. I'm glad I didn't give up on this because I learned so much about this particular drive, but also some of these, you've got the motor on the back here and you've got this little notch, you know. I'm guessing from factory that notch would be straight upwards, but because of the track at zero sensors being misaligned because of moving that bottom board and the issue with the heads, it needed to be adjusted anyway. Um, the thing is, there's a hair there as well, I'll get that hair out in a sec. The thing is with this, like I say, you've got to remember that it's, it's going to go up in steps. It's a stepper. So, you know, you, you, you're either here or you're there, you know, do, 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 in steps like that. It's not like you can just move a little bit like that, just a tiny little bit to get the, the, the alignment right. So if you've got alignment with one disc, yeah, it might be that, that you're on the very fringe, the very edge of the track. So moving this here, you're rotating the bar. Now bear in mind, if, you know, if you, once it's got in a stepped into a position, if you switched it off, then you rotate this little bit. What you're doing is you, you're moving the alignment like that, just ever so slightly, you know, a, a very small amount. You know, you move this a small amount and it moves a small amount. So, so I thought I'd expand on that just to give you some simple uh, diagrams to try and make it a bit easier to understand. 
how the adjustments have uh, made any difference. So this is the disc, you know, and this is just a part of the disc I've drawn here. So these lines here, this is a sector, you know, this triangular piece, it's split into sectors, and you have your tracks going around the disc. So uh, you have 80 tracks on uh, the Amiga format, 880K. So it's split into these sectors, there are 11 sectors. So it's split into 11 sectors, you've got 11 of these, uh, you know, slice slices all the way around the disc here. And in each one of these uh, bits here, you know, the track will accommodate uh, 512 bytes. Yeah, so that little piece there, 512 bytes. Now in terms of how those tracks look on the disc, you might have uh, a thickness to them. Well, you do have a thickness to them. So that's like just a piece of a track there. And you can see it's got this area here. Now on another disc, and in fact, I'll just draw the second uh, track. You know, these are a, a regular interval here. So there'll be, you know, a, a regular spacing between them and they should be approximately the same thickness. So I'll draw the contents of that track and the contents of that track. On another disc, you might find, let's do this one a bit lower down here that the track is a little bit thinner. The spacing is going to be exactly the same, but it might be, let's say, a little bit thinner. And some bits might be wider than others. It depends on the material. You know, the actual disc itself, the magnetic media, you get imperfection. So in one particular part of the disc, you might, it might be easier to read than another, if that makes sense. So that's just kind of like a really basic example of two different discs, maybe written from different drives. So this is our bubble bubble disc here, and this is the head. So you can see that we're just, let's say, put it there. We're just over the uh, edge. It's able to read it. And when you do a step on the motor, when it seeks to the next track, it, it's like, say, it goes up in the fixed not just there. You can't go in between. It's not like the head can go, oh, I'll move down a little bit. It can't. It goes step step like that and each time it's just on the very fringe of the edge of the track there each step it just goes doot, like that doot, doot. it's able to read the tracks yeah you put this disc in yeah straight away you kind of like you're outside it it can't read the data there it might be able to as it rotates some of the data might like say be just slightly aligned with just the tip of the head there but for the most part like say it couldn't read it and then it, again even when it does the step trying to check the disc you know it could did it did it it's like going up and backwards and forwards like that. i can't read anything because it's on the very very edge these are thicker traces on the bubble bubble disc so that let's say the final piece of the puzzle uh, me understanding the fact hang on a minute i can read bubble 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 but why can't i read anything else this is what i was theorizing i was thinking oh, this is how i was imagining in my head i was imagining that the head must be just on the very fringe here now, the difficulty I was having is working out how to get this aligned so that it would read everything. And the first thing I thought was, it must be the head alignment on the top. Well, it isn't. Because all you do when you move that head alignment is you're, moving, you're changing the alignment of the top head, right? So does that make sense? You've got the bottom head and the top head. Coming back to that example there, you know, you've, this is the top side of the disc. You've got the same thing on the underside of the disc, yeah? So, my thought there about adjusting the uh, positions on the head there, you know, the two screws on the head, all you are doing is moving the top head in relation to the bottom head. So, bubble, bubble, if that game is working perfectly, that is a clue that the top head is already correctly aligned with the bottom head. And this is the thing, this is why I was a bit stumped. And then, I, as I mentioned earlier, just from a bit of experimentation, I put a little bit of pressure on the head as it was trying to read one of the discs, I think it was Vroom, and it started to read. So then I was theorising, yeah, this is right, this theory here is right, that w when we hear, we can read it. In this case here, it's on the very edge. I'm putting a bit of forward pressure on the head. Oh, it's just on the very edge. And then it went up a track, it stopped again it was just going did it did it did it and i put a little bit of pressure there and oh it read that one and then went to the next track and i actually did that all the way until the game loaded i did that but several times and the game actually loaded and i was convinced then that this theory of me being on the fringe of bubble bubble you know on the outside of everything else that was the case and then i realized that motor at the back uh, you know it just dawned on me that because you can rotate it and it's, it's stepping, you know, go step, 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 step. That spiral, if you just rotate it a little bit, what you're doing is you're moving the head. It's like, say, it's fine adjust for the head. So, like, say, bubble, bubble. It's on the very fringe there. It can read bubble, bubble. We start to just move that little motor like that. Less than, I don't know, half a millimetre in total. 
we're in the middle of a bubble, bubble bubble so that still reads no issues there and when we come to this this disc here it's correctly aligned it might even be a little bit lower like that just because the way that disc has been written but then when it steps up it's correct does that make sense so it really was as simple as that you know the, the problem you've got here is when you've got numerous things going on the track zero sensor let's just revisit that as well you know the track zero thing that PCB underneath the two screws you can slide the board a good one, one or two millimeters up and back you know forwards and backwards like that so this first track here is track zero you know coming back to our example here on the outer outside of the disc let's just pretend that this line here that black bit or blue bit is track zero uh, and you can tell that like, because when you stick a disc in uh, you can see the head, head goes all the way up here and it's reading the very outer edge here typically if you look at these discs in the light sometimes you'll see more wear there because that's the bit that gets a bit more friction because you know as it starts spinning that's where the head is first on the disc if that makes sense that little PCB underneath, you know, it's got the track zero sensor on it. So as you move the board one way or the other, the track zero sensor moves. Um, so you've got your sensor, you know, obviously your head goes through that sensor. And as soon as it hits it, it breaks the beam because, all right, I'm at zero. But if you can move that sensor forwards and backwards like that because of the PCB moves, you're adjusting where the drive thinks track zero is. So right at the very start of this video, it was like that. You know, it was like, okay, re 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 move the head to track zero. Here we are. Oh, and then it's just going, did it, did it, did it, you know, it was moving forwards and backwards a little bit like that. Couldn't find anything, nothing there, you know, and then all I did is move that PCB, which effectively, again, is another fine adjust. So you've got two things going on on this particular revision. On other drives, you won't need to worry about the track zero sensor, because usually that's fixed onto a piece of the metal chassis here, and it has some cables coming off. On this one, as you saw, it's on the blooming PCB. Uh, now, that wouldn't be a problem if the PCB had holes that were designed just the right dimensions for the screw and that's it but on this one they aren't the kind of like uh, i'll show you the kind of the screw holes on the pcb are like that you know there's two of them there's one up here like that so your screw can be it can be here your screw can be here your screw can be here and anywhere in between and it's the same here yeah on any other drive, like I say, the PCB will have two little holes like that, and <laughs> you ain't got a problem. But the track zero sensor, you know, on this PCB here, on this drive, our track zero sensor is like this on the PCB here. You know, you've got uh, the IR diode on one side and uh, uh, the set, you know, the receiver part here, you know, the sensitive bit, and the, like I say, your, your beam of uh, light sort of uh, goes across there, and then the arm of the drive you know as the drive comes up it pushes through that on one of these other drives let's say somewhere on the metal work of the, the drive itself not on the pcb that's below it you'll have the uh, track zero sensor there actually fitted to the the drive mechanism you cannot you know you cannot move that out of position it's locked in position sometimes there might be a little uh, you know it might be on a pcb and you can unscrew it but again it'll have little screw holes like that that are super tight so when you screw it back on it can only be exactly where it's intended to be so yeah this particular drive revision i think is the worst one anyway the good news is i have thoroughly tested this drive it's been on test all week it's had a really, really, really good extensive uh, test and I had it on just last night playing uh, June and I had it going uh, just playing for about four hours continuously cycling around the demo. No problems at all, not a single reread. I can stick any of my discs in this drive and it will work. So I am very pleased with the uh, result there. You might think I'm crazy for spending so much time, but you know what? What I try to show on these videos is persistence pays off. If you don't give up, you will learn something. I've learned a lot about these, this particular model of these drives within this video alone. Yeah, so it was worth the uh, crazy amount of time I've spent. Uh, I feel better armed to be able to f deal with uh, alignment problems moving forward, actually. There are a number of things I picked up there, uh, including <laughs> use of bubble bobble, because I now know I'm quite used to bubble bobble, and I know that the alignment on that is different from my other discs actually. And if I can get bubble bobble working, I am 99% the way there to be able to get anything booted. Anyway, I do hope you found that video interesting. Please like, share, and subscribe. I'll catch you in the next video.